Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the This.Labs podcast. Here we are at episode eight. Today, we're going to be talking about frameworks, all sorts of frameworks, not even just the ones that popped into your head as I said that. Um, with us this week, we have a little bit of a lighter cast this week, but, uh, but we're going to soldier through. So today on this episode, we have Jared Overson, who's a director at Shape Security. Jared, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Rob. I, I'm really sad that you didn't bring your unicorn hat today. Uh, awesome. but, but congratulations to you and your team on, on, on your recent successes, So, Thank you very much. And we also are happy to welcome Frederick Preck, who's a senior developer at This Thought Labs. Frederick, how are you doing? Hi, Rob. I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rob Assel. I'm a senior developer at This Thought. So we're going to dive into our talk on frameworks. And before we get started, I just thought, you know, for everybody to sort of like give an interesting story or just the ways that frameworks have affected your career um, in interesting ways. And so um, the story that I wanted to tell is kind of an interesting one, which is that, you know, I am super passionate about the use of frameworks to bring more diverse people and just a broader range of candidates into web development. And I say that because the only way I was able to come back to web development, I did it as a teenager. The only reason I was even able to come back at all was because I found Angular JS. Um, I had been like a C-sharp desktop developer. I was joining a web company and I was just like, oh my God, I've missed so much. All this Ajax stuff, all this everything. I had no idea. I was like so far behind all the mental models I needed. But I watched this um, tutorial by Dan Whalen of an Angular JS, And I was like, this feels right. I can do this. I can make this work. And sure enough, you know, I was able to join the team and like get up to speed and actually produce things that were used on, you know, people's mobile devices for these major companies. And I was happy and productive. And eventually down the road, uh, hint, I'm still learning some of it, but <laughs> I'm starting to learn those things that I had no idea about when I came over. So um, I just, you know, I owe a lot to AngularJS um, as far as, you know, being able to be a web developer. Yeah, that's a really cool. Uh, and how about Jared? Uh, story, um, just because it, the, like you, you bring up the concept of just frameworks, just booting people up to a common baseline, uh, and and that is a really important part of it. Um, I guess the the first time that I remember jumping into uh, a framework uh, rather than just writing code uh, in in smaller snippets, but really understanding the whole, uh, was with Perl and the Moose object oriented system. Um, I forget what that stands for, but. I mean, we all have our preconceptions uh, or, or, or prejudices against uh, Perl and, and all the horrible things that it has done for the world. Um, but it was great at the time. Uh, and it was, uh, it was Moose that kind of elevated the level of object orientedness and organization um, in, in a lot of what you could do with Perl. And that was my first experience really like understanding what jumping into a framework uh, can do. And uh, I, I still remember that, that framework uh, fondly, uh, even after all these millions of years. That's awesome. How about you, Frederick? Well, back in the days, I used to enjoy Knockout JS, um, another framework, it's a library. Um, so I started off with writing everything myself, like route, not writing myself, combining libraries for routing and stuff like that. But then I discovered Durandal.js. Durandal.js is a framework using Knockout.js. So I was like, oh, this is what I need. So I started in investigating Durandal.js and it used Knockout, but it had built-in routers. Didn't need to combine everything myself. And I was like, this is what I need, right? Turned out not to be the best um, bet. Um, Durandal was, was abandoned and got, didn't got any actual active development. Um, but nevertheless, I think it was time well spent. I think you get to investigate stuff. You get to dive deep into frameworks or how things are going. So that went pretty well. Um, but yeah, that was probably not, not, yeah. Didn't really use Durandal. I didn't, I start investigating it, but it never really kicked off, I think. Um, but yeah, um. It does, I think it does help indeed um, for, for new people um, speeding up without having to build your own router, connect it to Knockout.js. Yes. I think I used Amplify.js, yes, uh, connect everything together. That's very complex, I think. Um, so even though frameworks can be complex, they do help you uh, speed up, I think. You know, it's an interesting thought too, right? Because like 
frameworks, at least if you're a web developer now, especially a JavaScript developer, it gets such this strong implication that this is a JavaScript contrivance that like only with JavaScript did we invent this idea of frameworks. But I mean, like I have worked on some ancient systems using things like struts that some people that are just starting out their software development careers might literally have not been alive when some of them were created. <laughs> um, frameworks are truly ancient in development. But to start out our conversation, right, like, I mean, I guess some people always like to define terms. And one thing that some people sometimes like to sort of parcel out is what makes a framework as opposed to a library. Is RxJS a framework or a library? Is Redux a framework or a library? Is Express a framework or a library? Is this an important question? And if it is, you know, how do you guys see the difference? I think the the common delineation uh, is is whether or not what you are using uh, is is taking more control away from you uh, than you are than you have yourself. So I, I guess even just the 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 programming term like inversion of control, it's like a framework uh, does more for you, and you plug things into that framework, and then it wires everything together, and then does magic somewhere else down the line, while a library is just some code that you're using in some other file or story you got somewhere else. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's where a lot of the, the, uh, the battles come from uh, because when you give up this control, you have just by the nature of doing that invested in that framework and you feel the need to defend it and make sure that it continues growing. I think both your stories at the start are a good example of why people feel uh, passionate about certain uh, frameworks because if it grows, then all of that skill and knowledge is transferable and it builds you up as a person. And if your framework dies, uh, then you might feel as though that all that experience is wasted. I think when, when you are li have libraries, uh, most of the libraries are, as, as Jared said, specifically for, for a specific use case. Um, basically, they allow you to do something um, and tell you how to do it. Uh, or, or, or what you want to do. But if you're using a framework, it's basically also helping you how you want to do it. Um, like like where you put, where are you putting, if you're talking about AngularJS, where you put controllers, right? We have style guides, but sometimes also frameworks have their own built-in style guides like Angular does. Uh, controllers go there, modules go there, components like this, you give them that name. So it helps to, to align projects. So a framework is more than only combining maybe libraries or just providing a lot of functionality like routers, few engines, anything else, but also helping you structure the project or, or at least guide you in some way. Um, not all frameworks, of course. We have like Express Yes, which is more like a framework that doesn't necessarily say this is how you should structure it. Um, but often it does help you in, in, in setting projects up, in, 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 in doing it the same way over and over again. Um, yeah, I think that... Is, is a big difference. And also yeah, a library is mostly smaller. I think RGS is, is a library, uh, to just as you mentioned, because it does one thing, one thing only. Um, even though observables in RxJS is huge, uh, it's not easy. It's not something you just look at and implement and you start being an uh, RxJS expert. Uh, but still, it's just a library that does one specific thing, observables. Um, while a framework, yeah, like Angular, uses RxJS under the hood for specific use case, for solving specific problems that Angular is, is, is having. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I I feel like you know I I um I enjoy video games a lot, and sometimes I watch uh, competitive video game playing. You know, people call esports and things like that. And I remember there was just constantly it's an eternal debate whether competitive video game playing is a sport or not a sport. And honestly, it's fun to talk about that kind of stuff, but I feel like no matter how you try to define sport, you're gonna emit some things that you believe are actually sports and you're going to allow some things that you actually don't believe are sports. So in the same vein, like my thought on a framework is a bit similar to Jared's, which is that to me, the difference is a framework is like the central spoke of your app architecture, right? Like it's every other decision is seen through the lens of that thing, right? Like. RxJS or the way that you approach reactive programming differs depending on the language you choose or the framework that you choose, which state management library you use differs based on that. Um, so I would probably agree that I wouldn't necessarily see RxJS as a framework or Redux as a framework, but it's hard to say that those things don't make substantial impacts on the architecture of your application. But honestly, I can't think of one instance in my career 
where having the precise definition of whether something qualified as a framework or not was actually relevant. I think when people talk about it with JavaScript, I don't know if you guys agree, at least with front-end JavaScript, when they're talking about frameworks, they really just mean how does your app render to the page? Like what is generating the actual HTML that the browser's consuming? Um, that is, I guess, how people have started to use frameworks. On the back end or elsewhere, I'm kind of not sure what people consider things like uh, Next and uh, Nest for that matter. I tend to think of as frameworks, but these are just sort of, sometimes people might just think they're packages of related tools. Again, I don't know that it matters necessarily. I think some of the arguments for things that you might call a library would still hold, even you know things that you would say about uh, frameworks would still hold for libraries, um, for some types of libraries. Um, but again, I, I think people will not do themselves any good if they bike shed over whether something technically crosses a line. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's not also that that important um, to to yeah exactly know if, if you're using a framework or a library as long as you know how to use it. Uh, in terms of Nest, I, I would say Nest is a framework, but if you start thinking about it, it's also just a wrapper about Express around Express. So yeah, it expresses the framework. Nest is maybe a library around Express, while it feels like an entire framework. So yeah, it's probably a question that that's has no silver bullet answer. Um, yeah, true. Okay, so my question now is, um, you know, I guess I'll set things up, right? So we won't necessarily go all the pros and all the cons. I gave some of the pros in my intro that I think that why frameworks are awesome. I think they're massive force multipliers. I think that there are a lot of ways to do the things that some of the modern front end frameworks do as far as, yes, you could do it in jQuery or you could do it in vanilla JavaScript, but people will make their own infinitely varied bespoke versions of these frameworks on their own teams if given enough leeway to do it. I love the way that frameworks tie communities together and say, this is how we solve a problem with this library. It helps people that are new to the industry really get up to speed and contribute quickly on projects that they might know nothing about other than they're an Angular project or React project. But of course, there are downsides, the biggest of which is bundle size, performance, load times, um, sometimes people doing way too much with JavaScript for what is maybe trivially solved with CSS and HTML, right? Sometimes people will, will have a, a solution in search of a problem. So knowing that there are positive and negatives, my question to you guys is, is when people will ask, should I use a framework? <laughs> my team is just starting. My project is just starting. My company's just starting. Should I use a framework? Is it worth it in the so, year uh, of our 2019? <laughs> I think uh, uh, my perspective on that is that uh, no matter what, you are going to end up using a framework. It's just a matter of whether or not you're building it yourself or you're using something that is already out there. And I think that, uh, that the metaphor I use when describing these things to people uh, is, is buying or building a house. Like you can buy a pre-built house uh, that is, you'll get it when you purchase it and it'll be good, it'll be up to code, it'll have whatever approved. Uh, it might not be perfect. Some of the rooms might not be laid out you want, uh, but you get it and it's able to be used immediately. Now, if you, wanna, if you want a house, but you don't wanna buy one, you can build it and you can put all the stuff together and you can do it all yourself and it might be perfect for you, uh, but the, the measurements might, might not be standardized, uh, the, it might not be up to code, uh, there might be some wiring that you fudged because it wasn't important to you, some rooms might not be finished. But regardless, at the end of the day, you're still gonna have a house on either side. Like that's why uh, you, you really don't get any value in not working with a framework because even if you're using a whole bunch of libraries and building them up, you're still creating a framework for how to build your application yourself. The problem with building it yourself uh, is that if you don't know exactly what you're doing or you haven't built one before or if you haven't torn down a house or a framework before to figure out how it's built, then you might be building it wrong. And then uh, if your company ends up needing to scale out, you're gonna have to boot everyone up to your framework internally. Um, and that's where just uh, using one of the ones that exist out there, you're going to get a lot of advantage right away. Uh, and if you're just starting and if you don't have enough experience to know exactly what a framework is and how it should be built, then you should absolutely 100% use whatever is the most popular framework that exists out there today. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting that you talk about um, writing own frameworks because indeed I agree and I think 
from a developer perspective, I mean, writing your own framework, it's great. It's cool, right? I mean, that's, that's probably, if you have the time and, and there's the money to do it, I think probably it's pretty amazing to, to be building it yourself. I'm just not sure if, if, if from the other side or the other point of view that it's, it's, it's interesting to be writing it uh, yourself. Uh, yeah, it's harder to find people that are qualified or have experience with the things you're using internally because you don't know, you've built it all yourself. You also have, as you mentioned, a, lot, uh, a steeper, um, a steeper curve, learning curve for, for new people to learn the framework. Um, depending on how well it's written, it can be easy yeah, because Angular or, or, or React or whatever is written by somebody. So it could have been you and me on a specific project, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be bad because it's written by ourselves. Um, but in the, in the end, I think you should use a framework. Um, my preference is use one that exists. Uh, given the open source we have, there's a lot of con possibility to contribute, to read the source, to understand the source code, to even step through the source code. Um, so it's not like you're developing in a black box. Um, so that's definitely something I think, but even uh, for, and let's say you want to have a static website, just HTML. Um, I have a lot of discussions about that, that you don't need a framework for just HTML site, right? But then you start creating HTML files, directories, adding CSS inside of it. Now you have Gatsby. Gatsby does all of that for you and it just spits out uh, HTML, right? So there's some pretty smart people that, that created a framework that does all of that. Well, probably for just HTML files, you don't need it but you don't get the benefit of modern JavaScript and, and all the modern stuff you have, unless you invest in putting it in yourself as well, right? So even for basic sites like, H, like basic static sites that just need a little bit of JavaScript, but you do want to use the most modern JavaScript of today, yeah, even frameworks like Gatsby can help, even though we can create it ourselves. I mean, probably takes a while, right? Gatsby isn't something just as, as isn't something that you write on a, on a single night, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, both of you make such great points. And it's funny because I, both of them resonated with me so strongly. So like on Jared's point, I've worked at a company where we built our own sort of CLI framework. It would scaffold out all your front end decisions and a build process for you and all of that. And we also had a, 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 a wrapper around Express and Node, very similar to the way Nest works. And it was great. Both the solutions were incredibly awesome. But what happened was, Eventually, we were the only project of the company that used them substantially, or few did. And so then when it came time to maintain those things, instead of leveraging and having the advantage of getting the force multiplying effect of having a community, you know, maintain those tools, suddenly the team had to both maintain the tool and the app they were building. And a lot of the advantages of using it were gone. And again, I, I don't know, the technology was great, but that's just an inevitable consequence. If you can't build a community around your tool, eventually you're going to be doing all the maintenance anyways. Um, and sometimes at that point, you know, some of the benefits go away. But, uh, you know, Frederick, you make a great point about um, static content. So that reminded me, I'd done a site recently in an AMP, not a full site, but I was working on some materials on AMP, uh, Google's framework. And I love AMP. I really do. I think it's got some really cool tools to help extremely um, intro level developers and advanced developers build stuff very quickly that that just has a very consistent look and feel and is performant kind of out of the box. That said, I found myself saying, oh, I have this menu. Well, on this other page, there's going to be the same menu. And on this other page, there's going to be the same menu. If I make a change, I literally have to go to all three. Like, I can't just edit the one component file and have it build. Now you can, there are solutions for this in the AMP community to, to leverage this, but I think that is a powerful reason to use things like frameworks, um, even if ultimately all you're going to do is compile it down to HTML, J JavaScript, and CSS. It doesn't have a runtime component. It's such a powerful developer tool for sharing code. Um, I think sometimes people take that too far, but it, it, it will be, it will save you mis copy paste mistakes as your site gets larger. Um, so if your site is, is anything beyond a trivial sort of marketing site, uh, you probably almost always want to reach for some type of framework to help you uh, set that up and share that code. So are you guys ready to get in trouble then? So are you ready to answer the question that, I mean, I don't want to make light of it. Honestly, for people, especially people coming into the industry, this is a very important question to them. It's one of the most frequently asked questions on the internet, on Stack Overflow, et cetera. 
what is the best framework? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll do this. <laughs> um, when I, when I, when people ask me that or ask me what, what, to, what to use, um, I will just tell them react, uh, because the, the community is massive. There is a ton of tooling around it. Uh, it does its job reasonably well. Now I don't use react. I don't like react and I don't want to ever use react. Um, because that's, that's my hang up and it might be, a might be part of uh, the way I grew up and just always rooting for the underdog and never really liking the established player. Um, but uh, there, there's some things about the, the, the way React is written and kind of the monoculture that has grown around it that I don't think it is, an, is, a, is a technology I want to invest in. Um, I, whenever I do uh, front end stuff now, which uh, albeit is, is uh, somewhat rarely, I use uh, Svelte because I think it's, it's moving in a good direction uh, Svelte, for people who don't know, uh, it's a it's a framework list framework, which is just another way of saying it's a framework um, that uh, uh, optimizes for the compiler as opposed to any runtime component. So you write your uh, components or UI or whatever else uh, in Svelte norms, and then Svelte, the command line tool, uh, will compile them all down to just bare bones JavaScript. Uh, so you don't really you don't like include Svelte in the browser, you use Svelte to compile JavaScript into your, your uh, distributable. Um, and that is, it, it's still got some quirks. It's not exactly, um, it's not uh, idiot proof, but I think it's, it's definitely moving in a direction that I am comfortable investing in. Interesting. I, yeah, I, I think it depends what you mean with best. I mean, um, for my, I think if we're talking about Angular, React, Vue, whatever, I think most of it comes down to what you prefer as a developer. Um, both of them can, can result in, in, in high performance applications. Both of them have a nice developer experience, I think, but I like Angular, but it doesn't mean Angular is better, right? Um, I like the syntax more, but that's personal. Um, same goes for React, right, or Vue. Um, so if you purely look at the developer experience, I think it's interesting that you take something that you enjoy working on to solve a problem. Um, it's also important that you use something that does solve the problem. Um, so get choosing the right tools for the right job. But I think with Angular, React, and Vue, often they can be used for the same same goal, right? Writing single page applications. Single page applications. Um, that said, I think NestJS is, is my go-to framework on the back end, Node.js, um, mostly due to the I call it developer experience. Um, I'm definitely not talking about performance and stuff like that because that's also an important point, right? Maybe for you, the best framework is the one that's the most performant, not in bundle size or whatever, but in overhead when it comes to backend code, maybe you don't want Nest and you want to be as low level as you can. Um, that can be the best framework, but yeah, I think it definitely depends. Um, I think you, we, you weaseled out of it. You need to you need to stand with a with a pitchfork ready uh, to defend your framework. In that case, it's Nest, the <laughs> which also implies a little bit of Angular because it's based on Angular. Um, even though I have to admit, Rob introduced me to React and Hooks, and I totally dig Hooks. Never used React ever. Just did a little bit with Rob, and I totally dig Hooks. Right. So, yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> I mean, because Jared is now challenging me, I have to plant my flag in the ground. God, though, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer. I, I honestly enjoy the th the, all three of the main three, right? Angular, React, and Vue. As an Angular JS holdover, um, Vue fits my mental model to a T. I, and I think that's true with a lot of Angular JS developers. That Vue just, for some reason, just feels the closest to, the, to, to that programming style. Um, as a C-sharp developer in past life, Angular immediately looked great to me because of TypeScript, although TypeScript is becoming quite ubiquitous. Um, and the reactive model of RxJS and the power of NGRx as a state management library. Oh, chef's kiss. Just, I love it. I love it. Um, and then React, I just find React the easiest thing to explain. I know that's weird to say, but because JSX can be very confusing to people, and I agree it is. But being able to explain people modern concepts like top-down data flows or unidirectional data flows, proper decomposition of UIs into components, 
the React model is so pure and they hold to it so strongly that it lets you say certain things with certainty that's so useful for somebody that's more junior or just getting into this because you can say things quite strongly and it's true in React. Whereas with other libraries, you're always like, okay, that's ideal, but you can do this and get around it or this and get around it. So um, I like all three for their own reasons. If I, if I had to only program in one forevermore, I'd probably pick React for a lot of the same reasons that Jared did. But that said, I think we would all agree here. And I want to assure anybody listening to this that if you pick any of these major frameworks now, the big three that we talked about, Angular, Vue, React, whether it's Svelte, whether it's Preact, whether it's Polymer, whether it's um, even AMP, uh, or whether it's the, the Ruby or Ember. Ember came back from the dead recently. <laughs> um, the king is dead, long live the king. Um, realistically, there are very few wrong answers in this space. Um, even like ASP.NET, um, MVC.NET, the, the Microsoft ones, the Java ones, those are all still live. The communities are still large. You can't go wrong as long as you don't stop with just learning the framework, but you continue to learn skills which are apply, that you can apply across frameworks. That's the key to longevity in this career. It's, it's not just to be an expert in a framework to be, but to use that to become an expert at web development and then apply that to other frameworks. And you can bounce then between with relative ease and then get up to speed in another framework when it inevitably comes along. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that part, the higher ability or people afraid that they're gonna get stuck. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, there's definitely a reason to be fearful. I mean, uh, all the frameworks that we've talked about so far, uh, we're saying you can't go wrong with, uh, but all the frameworks we're not talking about uh, are probably frameworks that you can go wrong with. Um, because they're they're not popular. Well, they're not as popular. Um, and uh, when a lot of stuff is driven by open source and the motivation of individuals or small teams, then popularity is king. That's where uh, that's where uh, just intrinsic motivation comes from. That's where uh, uh, donations come from. That's where PRs come from. If you don't if you don't get one that lives, then all the, your knowledge based around that framework will just evaporate and it will be just completely useless. Um, I mean, I'm obviously on an extreme and you can, you can still transfer a lot, uh, but using a framework is an investment and you wanna be investing uh, your time and your mental effort into something that is going to pay off over time. Um, so I, I think that there's, there is, is definitely uh, a lot of value in, in figuring out what you wanna uh, invest in and then sticking with that um, sticking with the one that, that you really want to learn, the one that, that makes you motivated to keep on learning, the one that makes you motivated to dig into its internals, uh, to contribute to its documentation, uh, to, to uh, look at PRs, to watch videos on it. Uh, because if you're just using what's popular, but you don't like it for whatever reason, then you're not going to go those extra steps that Rob was talking about. Uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna figure out how how something works and to transfer those skills somewhere else. You're just gonna be doing your job, and that's great when all you want is a paycheck. But if you're looking to grow and and make your investment turn out to to more than it is, or the more that you paid in, uh, then you do need to put that extra effort in. So the only thing that I'd push back on on that, because again, I I I don't know why I'm like I don't know where I'm connected on, on tech Twitter, but like I, I intersect across a, a bunch of these and I see a lot of junior developers who are like, what should I learn? And it's a, it's a important thing to them because it's their career and they're just starting. And I think each of the, like the main three we'll say has a narrative which works against them. So there's been recently a lot of talk, especially when you look at um, particular uh, um, surveys that have like, put Angular as the dead category or the dying category, like it never caught on. But I'll tell you, as a consultancy shop, we talk to companies constantly that are using Angular. It is definitely widely adopted. It is not dead, no matter what the surveys say. The methodology of the surveys is not, it's not like they're doing anything wrong, but it, they're not completely scientific either. So don't worry too much about what the surveys say. With Vue, people always say, well, it's not backed by a major company. It's not Google or Facebook. Nobody uses it. It, it doesn't matter, right? And to that, again, I say it's, it's been catching on and it's, it's growing like wildfire, right? It's surpassed React and stars for whatever matters. Stars matter. But I mean, like it's, it's hot, it's growing. And I've, I've heard of a lot of companies migrating to it. On the React side of things, I've seen a lot of talk recently that React is in like 
they call it like the late stage capitalism <laughs> mode that React is peaking. And there's a lot of talk, oh, React's peaking. This is the wrong time to get in. It's just about to start to decline. It's getting passed by Vue. It's, it's superseded by Preact. It's this, this, this. And I think, again, React is still by far the largest community of these three. Tales of their demise is overblown. So I think you can find the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt about any of these frameworks. Trust me, no matter which one you're going to pick, I can, sh I can make a case why you shouldn't and make a case why you should. So uh, don't worry about it too much. But I think, Jared, you're right. I think once you get into this world, pay attention to what you like and don't like. Don't, don't burn yourself out of the industry because you use React because it's the biggest community and you just hate React or you don't like the libraries that are associated with it or you don't like the programming style that doesn't mesh with yours, don't kill yourself to just be in the biggest community. There, there are many uh, large niche communities you'd be completely fine in um, if something else fits your model much better. Yeah, and there's, uh, th there's one thing, one good thing that I will say about React is that it has taught a lot of people a lot of very valuable lessons about UI development. Uh, statelessness, uh, immutability, um, uh, proper flow of data. Like back in the backbone days or even jQuery, you had like 1800 different bindings all over the place that just, just cascaded into a nightmare of, of uh, just beat up state. And it was, a, it was horrible, made horrible applications. Uh, it, it made things very, very hard to test. Uh, so React has definitely elevated the state of UI development, um, but that's also something that now that you've gotten everyone on board and everyone agrees that, yay, uh, not updating the DOM 1,800 times a second is a good thing, then all the other frameworks are going to do stuff like that. So you don't really need to buy into React to get all that. You get all that by just buying into a modern framework that is still up to date. I also think it's important that, that if you're if you're deciding which framework you want to invest in. In case, in my case, I live in Belgium. Um, when I used to do consultancy in Belgium, let's say two years ago, I think everything was Angular. Obviously, there were a few a few view projects and a few uh, React projects, but they were very little. So if you would invest in Angular when you're working in the Belgian market, it would really help you. If you would invest in React, it'll be harder to get a job because there'd be more competition or for the same job. So that's, I think, just thinking about your job is also, that's also an important part. But on the other side, you also have to enjoy what you're doing, right? So if you enjoy React, yeah, you want, you should learn React. But I think if you are learning React uh, and a component-based architecture, smart dumb components or, or presentational components or what you call it, um, that also applies to, to, to Angular. And I would assume to Vue. I have zero experience with Vue. But there's a lot of conceptual um, overlap between all these frameworks, uh, even though you will have to spend some time on learning APIs and, and framework specific stuff. If you're familiar with a lot of concepts in modern front end uh, development, such as the CSS part, a lot of pure ECMAScript or JavaScript, um, it will help you and it will not be time wasted, I think. Um, looking back at what I told about Durandal, for example, um, that was time wasted if you look at it as specific. Um, angle. But for me, I, I think it was valuable. I, I invested time in getting to know something, understand it, right? Um, and that, that's great. Um, in the end, I couldn't use it. So, so when, when AngularJS came out, um, I immediately jumped AngularJS. Well, not when it came out, but I jumped on AngularJS. But I had a lot of conversations with people asking me, why wouldn't you wait, right? Who says AngularJS is going to survive? I was like, I don't care. I like this and I want to get better in this, right? And it will eventually help me in my career as a developer. Um, but it depends indeed if, 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 if all you want to do is, is get your paycheck, as Jared said, and, and want to use the framework and don't dive deep into it. Yeah, then I, I would definitely go with pure popularity and, and, and ensure that what you're using is, is allowing you to keep working for the, for, the few, for the coming years, which I think isn't a bad thing. I, I don't think everyone in, in the development community should be... Um, constantly um, how just innovating and learning all the newest stuff. I mean, it's pretty fine if you're just, I like React how it is, I just want to do React, fine. That's, that's great. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But, but yeah, um, I don't think you can choose a wrong framework. Um, definitely not. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too. I was just recalling from another conversation that we have had on this podcast, as well as a conversation I saw on Twitter, which, which was, you know, with these frameworks, with newer frameworks or new approaches with each of these frameworks, I think you need to make sure too that you are only adopting as much like first adopter risk as your team is both capable and willing to absorb. <laughs> um, there are t- teams that jumped immediately into CSS and JavaScript that might be regretting that for their own teams or they jumped into a particular framework and the community never coalesced around it or it just didn't work with their team or the programming style. So that is another reason why it's not always bad to go with even last gen frameworks as long as they're being maintained. Um, You know, like your embers, right? There's still a strong case to be made for ember because it's kind of a known quantity at this point. I feel it's kind of that way with all the main three, but still, you want to be careful with the frameworks that you don't want to immediately jump onto the next big thing, whatever's coming next down the road, uh, because you don't, unless your team is capable of dealing with the potential risk of that failing and what to do next. Yeah. We, we, you've all seen the, the technology adoption curve, right? Like the, like the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and the laggards. Uh, it's definitely absolutely very important to make sure that if you are adopting something new, that you fully understand the risk around it. You're not just hoping it's gonna work out because even those first few iterations are going to be painful. Uh, and it's, it's very often better to let other people go through that pain when you have something important on the line. If you're, if you're screwing around and if you're playing or if you're really interested in, in, in learning something, those new technologies are perfect uh, to play with because whatever you're building, you might just throw away anyway. It's not gonna be critical, um, but you're gonna understand why they exist, why were they created and, and what value they are bringing to the world to know whether or not you should look into them uh, later down the line uh, for a critical project. Now, I know we've, we've actually, we've, we've uh, kind of, I mean, we, we have not uh, held Ember in the best light in this talk uh, so far, but Ember has been, uh, the most uh, consistent framework and uh, welcoming and productive community out of any framework that I've seen. So uh, if, if, uh, if you're looking at a framework, I do recommend throwing Ember in there uh, because it has lasted, it outlasted the generation of frameworks that it, exist, that, that it existed with. So like Backbone, um, Knockout, uh, even the early Angular days, uh, and, and it's still going strong. And literally every single person, uh, save for maybe just a handful I've known who've used Ember, uh, has been fantastic, welcoming, uh, a good person, and highly productive in what they're doing. Uh, so, I mean, Ember's, Ember's still out there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, back to the uh, adopting uh, to early technology, I remember back in the day with Backbone and everyone jumping onto Backbone as quickly as possible because it was just a natural segue from jQuery uh, heavy applications. And then uh, people were jumping into uh, Airbnb's uh, server-side rendering of Backbone applications with PhantomJS. And it's like, those are the types of technologies that will bite you in the ass hard if you double down on them way too early because you're not coming back from a PhantomJS rendered website and jumping into anything modern without a monstrous amount of work. Yeah, that's a great point. Honestly, yeah, it, you know, I, the part that I'd like to joke about with Ember is just that everybody keeps calling it dead and it just refuses to die. It has that cockroach quality. They just keep churning out new major versions of it that are just, just keep being awesome. So what hundred percent- Or classic. I think it, depending on how you phrase it, it looks differently. <laughs> exactly, it's all in the town. Uh, no, absolutely. And I mean, Tracy, the founder of this thought, I mean, that's where she got her feet wet was in the Ember community. They were incredibly welcoming. A lot of the people that are the thinkfluencers, the influencers, people like Ryan Florence, they got their start in the Ember community, or at least they passed through the Ember community. Um, it has launched a ton of awesome careers and continues to support a ton of awesome careers. So, you know, another great, uh, another, you know, another great choice and used, used on a lot of sites, a lot of surprising sites. And a lot of good things that Ember has built into their into their uh, framework and community uh, are stolen from uh, by other frameworks in order to make them better. Like even just the the entire React router started a lot from Ember's router. 
And the people, like when you, when you invest in a framework, you, you, you can bring the best parts of it to where you want to go if you've, if you've learned everything you need to learn. Yeah, I mean, the Angular CLI, which is one of the greatest or one of the best CLI tools on the market was forked or whatever was adopted yeah. from Ember CLI. So yes, it is the, the, the legacy of Ember is in every framework and in all the blog posts that you read, I mean, trust us. Um, but I know this idea of community, I think is the great, great transition to the part that we wanted to kind of finish with, because one of the things that I find incredibly fascinating about development, uh, with the web development with JavaScript and then development with frameworks is the degree to which people will coalesce into communities around each of those things, right? You ask me what the Lodash community is. I got no answer for you, right? You ask me what uh, the Bcrypt community is. I got no answer for you. But you ask me what a React developer is like, or that community is like, or an Angular community. And that means a lot. And I think, you know, we don't necessarily always identify as just programmers, right? We feel like we might have less in common with a Python developer or a Java developer, um, but we feel like a strong community is JavaScript developers. So I don't, I'm just curious, throw it to you guys, like, what do you guys think about, you know, what, uh, how people will associate as front-end developers, as JavaScript developers, as Angular developers, um, and what should people be looking at, you know, when they're navigating this space uh, and looking for a community that they want to associate with? I think it depends on what you're looking in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the community. Um, you can use a community like meetups, conferences, um, to share knowledge, to give, give a talk or, or just enjoy other people's talk. Um, you also have online communities like like you want to get help on Gitter and stuff like that. Uh, you can have, you have Gitter that has active RxJS channels even. It's not a library framework, it's a library, but there's a, an RxJS uh, community that's always ready to help you. Same with Angular and React. Um, I know Gatsby is on Discord, for example. Um, so there's a lot of awesome people that are just available for your questions, um, helping you pointing you to the right directions because it's not always easy to find the correct, uh, the correct documentation or even the correct way to do it, right? Even though there is documentation, maybe it doesn't help you what you want to achieve. Um, so there's a, there are a lot of awesome communities and I think but Angular, Vue, React, they're all amazing, right? They have their own conferences around the, around the globe. Um, you can attend them anywhere. So yeah, uh, any of those three major frameworks, because yeah, the more popular the more popular the frameworks is, the bigger the community, of course. So the the, the more value you get from the community, um, that's 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 great. But also you can also contribute to the community, right? That that's the thing with, with the open source. You can either contribute to the to the project itself and be part of the of the the community that's more more bound to to the GitHub repo and, and really updating the docs or even the code. You can also just help people be active on Twitter or whatever and just, I remember when, when I learned, when I started to learn Angular, I didn't have an Angular project. So I just hang around Gitter. I just watch people ask questions. I had no idea, spent 20 minutes Googling and answered the question for him. And I was like, now I know how to do it, right? So that helped me a lot um, in, in, in boosting up my own knowledge. Um, so even that is something that you can do if you're somebody that likes to help people um, uh, in solving their problems. Um, definitely a lot of awesome communities out there. And, and I think all of them are pretty welcoming. Um, so there's nothing to be afraid of to join any of them. Um, of course, from time to time, people might say that, that your question is not relevant or whatever. Um, but I think you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Um, ask for how can this be done? Um, definitely. Um, there's a lot of awesome people that are always there for you. I think we, we talk, or actually a lot of people talk about uh, like a, not even just JavaScript or, or UI stuff, just framework communities in general, uh, as if there's just like one sort of morphing blob that kind of just walks around uh, all computer areas and just kind of just sucks people in or spits people out. Um, but the, the reality of all these things is that there are, there are, pockets or bubbles of communities that that sometimes just don't even overlap so when we talk about communities it's really just like how many people are using this stuff and talking about it publicly not that they are all interrelated 
like there's Stack Overflow communities where there are people who ask and answer questions that, that might not overlap with GitHub communities and might not overlap with Twitter communities and Facebook communities. Uh, it's just all bubbles of people who are talking about this publicly. Uh, so that's, that's, that's important to, to realize as well because it also means that, that you can start your own community. You can also take a community uh, and, and uh, bring it to where you want it to be. Like if there's something that you really find passionate and you're learning a lot about and, and you think it's great, then go answer questions on Stack Overflow. Go contribute to documentation. Uh, go build your own part of that community uh, and then you are the community. And uh, that's something that I think a lot of people uh, look at with, with kind of fear sometimes. You see these giant names uh, who, who just t suck all the oxygen out of the room and uh, some people defer to them for opinions and, and, and direction, but you don't need to do that. You know, any, anyone can answer questions and contribute uh, how they want to contribute. Yeah, and I mean, my opinion on this is that, you know, whether you want to or not, when you take up one of these frameworks and you contribute in any meaningful way outside of your company, you're joining a community, again, whether you want to or not. And so it's incumbent on you and on all of us to uh, shepherd the type of community that you want to be a part of um, in, in whatever way you can. And, you know, again, because frameworks are such a powerful tool in getting people into this community, the way that the community is perceived by people joining it from the outside is going to determine how many of those newer developers are going to want to participate or be successful and who amongst those people will be successful in that group. Now that said, I think that again, I know I focus a lot on the big three. It's just because it's the ones that I know the most about. I'm sure this is universal, but like there are, each of them is innovating and then learning from each other. So for example, there's NG Girls, which is a really awesome series of meetups um, to get women involved in the Angular community. But then there's also the incredibly successful Vue Vixens group, uh, which does a similar thing with Vue and is all over the globe. It's amazing. And there's an entire conference for women uh, with React, the React.js Girls Conference, which was in London. I'm not, I, I actually, I should have looked up wh when the next one is, if, if they're having it again. Um, but I know that that was super successful too. So I think there is room to, uh, no matter who you are, to, to find a place to fit in. But I think it's incumbent on everybody to, be cognizant of the fact that because frameworks are so core to so much of web development, you're in that community whether you want to or not. So if you see somebody contributing a piece of code or a blog post, or you, you, know, you saw somebody's talk and you liked it, please just be part of the positive voices. <laughs> Reach out and say that um, because there's enough jerks. There's enough assholes on the web already making their voices heard. Uh, we just need more people lifting each other up. And I think that's why I have at times found the Angular community to be one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most is just how accessible some of those people are and how much they appreciate hearing that the work that they're doing is appreciated. Um, not to say that anybody else isn't, I've just had a lot of personal interactions with people like Deborah Carrada or John Papa and others like that. And I just think that's so powerful to just uh, to lift up creators and other members of the community uh, when you can. It's, it's more powerful than you think to just drop a tweet that just says, love that talk. On that note, that's also interesting to mention. Um, so I hung around Gitter a lot, as I mentioned. So that I was just answering questions. And then I start chatting with somebody from the Angular team, right? Um, George Kalpakas, I think is, is, is what his name is. Um, and he basically pulled me into contributing to Angular. He was like, come. Uh, you can, you, I can help you, right? So here's an issue. If you want, I can help you get set up and fix it. And I was like, okay, let's do that, right? And I've helped other people do the same thing as well because I think that's also interesting, right? Um, helping people spin up whatever they want to do. I, I think he saw that I wanted to contribute. So he thought like, I'm going to help him get spin up in AngularJS. Funny enough, he did the exact same thing with Angular a few months later, spinning me up with the Angular repo, allowing me to build stuff. Um, so there are a lot of um, awesome people that are always willing to help um, getting you spin up with contributing or whatever, helping or yeah, reviewing blog posts even, right? You send out a tweet, anyone up to reviewing my blog post? And there's definitely going to be a few that will reply. Yeah, send over the link. Um, so yeah, the communities are awesome. All right, great. Well, I think that's probably a great place for us to wrap up. 
Um, you know, one of the things that we like to do on the This.Labs podcast is just sort of celebrate some of the things that, is, that are important to us, values that are important to us. And again, one of those that we just mentioned is lifting up other people in the community and just celebrating cool stuff that we've seen. So what we wanted to close on today was just, you know, do you guys have any talks or content um, that, uh, that, you know, you really wanted to share with other people? And, you know, I wish I would have used this opportunity to lift up some voices that aren't heard from as often, but I honestly just got so excited by this talk that I saw. I've, I just had to share it. So um, it's, it's, it's by uh, this guy, David. I'm not even going to try his last name. I apologize. But on Twitter, it's David K. Piano creator of the X state library talks a lot about state machines and at react rally this year, he gave this talk about how to use state machines to model your uh, business logic, which is something that we talk about when we talk about our PAM stack. Uh, it's such an important thing that I think for simplifying applications. However, he showed how you can tie it um, to popular testing libraries to automate your testing, to generate tests automatically based on your state machine. Uh, the tests will, You'll teach it how to do the transitions between the states, and then the, the, the code will auto-generate the tests which do those things. He does a demo of it on stage. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It could absolutely be a game changer. I think in 2020, I think state machines are going to be everywhere. I think we're going to hear about them constantly. Um, so I would 100% recommend. Uh, it's the, t the talk is called Write Fewer Tests from Automation to Auto-Generation uh, from React Rally this year. Absolutely amazing talk. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I'll I'll check that out. Uh, the the one that uh the one that I uh, uh, threw up was uh, one actually by my my CTO Schumann Gosmajumder. Um, he's a CTO of Shape Security. Uh, he did a a keynote on deepfakes. Uh, I've been doing a lot of deepfake research recently uh, because it's just a genuine genuinely interesting topic. Um, and uh, I want to, to understand what the state of deep fakes is for at least the, the uh, consumer available technology. Um, but the talk is great because it's just a, it's a kind of like a where we are now in fake news, fake information, fake video, fake audio, and then how we're going to evolve going forward uh, because this technology is not going away. Uh, there's, there are companies who are trying to, to hold their technology close to their, their chest because they say it's too dangerous to be released to the public. Like that's just dumb. It's going to be out there at some point anyway. It's better for us to understand uh, what the state of fake stuff is now so that we can adapt faster uh, and move on from it. Um, but I, I think the, the, the TLDR of it, uh, TLDW, uh, is uh, it's already a nightmare. It's already awful. And we're going to have to get it through it extremely quickly uh, in order to be happy with ourselves going forward. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, the article I'd like to share is one that I found myself sharing quite often. Um, it's not from somebody who's still active in the community. Sadly, he left the community for, for joining another community. Uh, I'm talking about Pascal Precht um, uh, from Tothram. Um, he was very active in Angular Jazz and Angular. I pretty much learned Angular from him, so credits to him as well. Um, but he has a, a series on Angular change detection, which I think today is still relevant if you want to understand how Angular does change detection, um, which I think is very crucial if you want to have high performance applications because you want to know what's happening under the hood. You want to know why you are creating a new array and not pushing items into it and stuff like that. Um, that together with Brian Ford's YouTube video on how the hell or what the hell is Zone.js, I think is what it's called. He has a, a video explaining how Zone.js works. Um, the video is so old that the API is totally out of sync, but conceptual, it's still in, 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 it still lines up with what's, what Zone.js is today. I think so. If you want to understand angular chain detection, you also have to understand zone yes at some level. So those two are pretty important, I think, for uh, understanding angular and how it does change detection. So that's definitely the two I would like to share. Well, awesome. All right. Well, that'll do it for our podcast today on frameworks. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. And thank you to my fellow co-hosts for participating. You know, as we always say, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. If you have any reaction to anything that we said today or any additional questions or topics that you'd like us to talk about in the future, please send them to us. 
Uh, you can find me online on Twitter at RoboCell. So that's R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. Jared, you can find on Twitter at J.S. Overson. So that's J-S-O-V-E-R-S-O-N. And Frederick, you can find on Twitter at Frederick Preck. Obviously, I don't need to spell that, um, but I will anyways. It's at F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K-P-R-I-J-C-K. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us once again, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.